I'm really glad you can all make it and um really delighted to be ho hosting this discussion on Englishness, the new force in British politics. Um, also uh, delighted to be joined by Ilsa Henderson and Richard Wynne Jones. Um, just introduce them and then give a few reflections on why having these sort of discussions and try to understand some of these uh, big forces in politics is important to the electoral reform society. Um, so Ilsa, first of all, Ilsa is a professor of political science at the University of Edinburgh. She co-authors the National Question and Electoral Politics in Quebec and Scotland, and she's a principal investigator for the Scottish Election Study and co-directs the Future of England survey. And Richard Wynne Jones is professor and director of the Wales Government Centre at Cardiff University, and is the co-author of Wales Says Yes, Welsh Devolution and the 2011 referendum. With Ailsa, Richard is co-director of the Future of England survey, um, and they both co-authored the book uh, which this uh, seminar is titled after. So um, I'm Willie Sullivan, I'm the uh, Senior Director of Electoral Reform Society, and we've just um, produced our new strategic plan for the, for the next five years, and, and obviously we're a campaign organisation, and Hopefully, um, uh, you know, as members, our, our aims are to change the electoral system, uh, have an elected House of Lords, all these big constitutional changes that make British democracy better. But in putting our strategy together, it's really important that we begin to... I, I always talked about it as a kind of, you know, we've got a destination to get to and, and, and a sailing metaphor, um, but we need to understand the, the weather and the currents and tides that are flowing through British politics. And I think Englishness is probably one of those, um, uh, whether we can, whether it's a, a front that's against us or whether it's a tide that takes us forward, that's something we've got to work out. But just really interested to hear um, what Ilsa and Richard have to say about that. I mean, they've been doing lots of survey work on it. I've got lots of data and I've been thinking uh, and discussing it for a long time. So I think they're probably some of the, if not the leading um, uh, academics on this subject in, in, in the UK. So um, over to you for a presentation for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll have a short discussion and then take some questions from, from the audience. So I think Ilsa, you're starting. Thanks so much for the invitation to, to speak here today. It's a, it's a real treat. And um, Largely because this project is something of a labor of a labor of love. And um, in 2007, we we tried to find funding to look at England as part of a larger comparative project that looked at regions and different European states. And every national funder we approached uh, said yes to the project. So they said yes in France. They said yes in Austria and Germany and Spain. And when we went to the UK and we told them what we were trying to do and that we wanted to look at England and compare it to not just Scotland and Wales, but to regions and different European states, we were told that there was really no point because there was nothing going on in England, that there was no real sense of English national identity. And to the extent that there was, it wasn't really connected to anything that was relevant to, to politics or, or political Scientists And so they gave us money to look at Scotland and they gave us money to look at Wales and we compared them to all the other um, regions in those other European states. But the claim that there was absolutely nothing to see really, um, really bothered us and struck us from our different kind of perspectives um, at, in different subfields of, of political sciences can just um, intuitively, um, intuitively incorrect. Uh, and so as part of a larger team, we we um, we kind of cobbled together funding to launch in 2011, the first Future of England survey. And since then, we've been doing it near near annually since then. And the result is this uh, almost 10 years of uh, of data on attitudes to English national identity and how English national identity connects to other things that we think are politically relevant. So in terms of what we know. We know that English national identity is rising. Uh, in 1992, the proportion of people in England who described themselves as British was in the 60s, 60%-ish. 60 
and the proportion describing themselves as English was in the 30s. And since then, we've seen a 10 point jump in the proportion of people who describe themselves as English. So, so Englishness is rising. But the story is as much about the fact that we are seeing a far faster fall in the proportion who describe themselves as British. And now that's around uh, around 40 percent as well. So they're in about a bit of a dead heat, really, in terms of the strength of different national identity groups in England. And that's a change in England that's taken place over about 25 years. And that's interesting in part because the equivalent change, a rise in sub-state national identity and a far faster drop in British identity, is a change that took place over a much longer period uh, in Scotland. So that's part for us of the interesting, the interesting puzzle here, the rise in Englishness, but the far faster drop in Britishness. And we think that's interesting in itself, but we also think that that's interesting in part because of the way that English national identity relates to other clusters of political attitudes. And the first of those is uh, attitudes to, to Europe and a sense of, of Euroscepticism. It's not quite commonplace to argue that English national identity relates to Euroscepticism. But at the time when we started collecting data in 2011, it was, uh, it, it was a slightly more controversial claim, or at least a claim that didn't have a substantial bedrock of evidence behind it. But the other, the other claim is that it, English national identity relates to a, a sense of devo anxiety or dissatisfaction with the constitutional status quo in the union as a whole. And it's a, it, it presents itself as kind of general dissatisfaction, but it also has a particular target in its sights, and that target is Scotland. And that manifests itself in two ways as a sense that Scotland has undue access to resources that the rest of the union just doesn't have, but also a sense that Scots have far more influence within the union and Scotland as a unit has more influence within the union than it should have. So that's our two unions argument. This notion that uh, attitudes to Europe and attitudes to the domestic constitution are linked. So the more Eurosceptic you are, the more devo anxious you are, but also that both of those are related to English national identity. So the more you prioritize your English national identity, the more Eurosceptic you are and the more devo anxious you are. What else do we know? We also know that English national identity is unlike Scottish and Welsh national identity. And it's unlike it in, in different ways. The first is that it has completely different predictors. So the kind of individual by, by demographics or socioeconomic position who describes themselves as English is not the same demographic in the same demographic or socioeconomic position as the person who would describe themselves as Scottish or Welsh. So visible minorities in England, for example, are far less likely to describe themselves as English than is the case in Scotland and in Wales. Younger folks are far more likely to describe themselves as Scottish or Welsh in Scotland and Wales, but we don't see that same strong pattern in England. So it's unlike Englishness is unlike Scottish and Welsh identity, in part because it has different predictors, in part because the attitudes that attach to Englishness are not the same as the attitudes that attach to Scottish identity and Welsh identity. In fact, the attitudes that attach to English national identity are those that attach to British national identity in Scotland and in Wales. So it works this way, obviously, in terms of Euroscepticism, but also in terms of assessments about Westminster, Westminster influence within the union. And related to this, what the data have been showing us is that Britishness operates in completely different ways, depending on where in Britain you live. And so the most obvious example of that is that if you're a British identifier, then you tended to vote remain if you were living in England, but you tended to vote leave if you were living in Scotland or Wales. However, even though English national identity is unlike Scottish and Welsh identity in a number of different ways, there is one area where it does seem to share uh, a little bit with Scottish and Welsh identity. And that is in the sense that English identifiers do seem to demonstrate a desire for some form of English self-government. 
And and on that point, I will hand it over to to Richard. Thanks, Elsa, uh, and uh, good evening, everybody, and thanks for that uh, welcome, Willie. Um, so, in terms of of the book, um, our argument, our central argument in the book is that Englishness is already changing the face of, of British politics. It's not some uh, we we quote. A, there's a very famous line that always gets trotted out about the people of England have not spoken yet. Most of you will know that line. Uh, we 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 repeat it to say that's no longer true. They're speaking. Uh, very forcefully, uh, and we talk about the 2015 UK general election, which in which the Conservative Party deliberately mobilised English sentiments. And most of you will recall. Um, I think I suspect the only thing you'll recall from that election is the little poster of initially Alex Salmond with Ed Miliband uh, in his pocket, and then after Nicola Sturgeon does so well. In the TV debates, they substitute her picture for Salmond. Um, they very deliberately mobilise English national sentiment uh, in uh, in that general election. It's their unexpected victory that begets uh, the, the Brexit referendum. And we show in this book and we've shown in a series of other publications how English national sentiment underpins uh, the Brexit majority, the narrow Brexit majority. Um, and as Ilsa said, we, we, we can also show that people in England are very dissatisfied with the way that England is governed and want to see some kind of change. The problem with working out what that change might be is there are three kind of major structural barriers to thinking about the governance of England. One of which is just the sheer size of England. England is 85% of the population of the state, let's say around 85% of the economic activity. England is enormous. Scotland is 7%, Wales is 5%, Northern Ireland is 3%. So that's barrier number one. Barrier number two is that you've got at the heart of the state a fusion of Anglo, of English and British functions that is almost complete. There are very, very, very few distinctive English institutions that are not somehow also British institutions. And then finally, you've got public attitudes, uh, which I'll return to in a moment, which actually make some of the preferred solutions uh, untenable. Now, in terms of how people have thought about um, governing England, two um, kind of approaches tend to be set up in opposition to each other. People either talk about an all England solution, somehow treating England as a, as a unit, or uh, regionalizing England in some way. And they're usually seen as in opposition. They're not, I mean, logically you could do both, right? But that's never how these things are spoken about. So let's just start quickly with treating England as a unit. Now this has got, this has got, Lots going for it, apparently, logically, because um, certainly anybody here from Scotland, England, uh, sorry, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland will realise that England is already a de facto unit of government for many purposes. And I think that the COVID um, experience has, has, you know, has reminded or has brought to the attention of people, even in England, that this is the case, because obviously... The UK government is, for all most purposes in the context of the, of the pandemic, the UK government has been the English government. So England is de facto a unit. Why not recognise that? It's also the case that in terms of public attitudes, if you ask people in England to choose between a regional solution and an all England solution, they always choose an all England solution. Okay, so treating England as a unit appears logical in the sense that England is already a de facto unit. It goes with the grain of public attitudes. However, and here's the big but, you come against, you, you hit against two really big problems, the size of England and the institutional fusion that I spoke about. So if you were to, so people talk about radical federalism these days, it's not even enough to talk about federalism, you have to talk about radical federalism, right? If you treat England as a unit within a federal UK, 
the argument is that it would be so large, it would unbalance the whole arrangements. It's 85% of the whole. The English level would inevitably challenge the federal level for power and legitimacy. Also, to federalise on that basis would require kind of complete institutional disentanglement of England and Britain, massive changes to everything in a context in which, frankly, most English people think they've already got a parliament. So you're, it's a huge ask. The alternative that uh, is an alternative which has been tried, which is to carve out a place for England within the current arrangements. And we've had that, well, we had it until very recently, between autumn 2015 and earlier this year, there was an arrangement for English votes for English laws in operation. That was a long-standing policy uh, objective of the Conservatives. But of course, this was designed to cause the minimum amount of disruption to the Anglo-British Anglo fusion of the heart of the state. And basically, it didn't change anything. In fact, it literally changed nothing during the whole period of its operation. And our best estimate is that only 2% of people in England ever realised that they had English votes for English laws. And we suspect that half of those were probably mixed up about the question we were asking. I mean, basically, nobody noticed it existed and nobody cared when it was binned. So that's treating England as a unit. The alternative is to regionalise England. This is hugely appealing to elites, uh, especially, but not only on the central on the centre left. It's hugely appealing to unionists in Scotland and Wales. The idea is divide England into Scotland-sized chunks to rebalance the union. It also makes a lot of functional sense in a context in which England is wildly over-centralised. I mean, the idea that Whitehall is controlling individual schools across England, I find, as a Welshman, I find utterly baffling. But there we are. Um, so they're, they're, you know, hugely appealing. However, public support is lacking. Um, and that's a huge problem uh, which you really can't um, wish away. Also, which units, which powers, these are key questions which have never been resolved. Uh, and neither is it clear on the issues of powers that even supporters of federalism, so-called, actually want a legislative parliament on the Scottish or even on the Welsh basis for, say, the north west of England. So even if you did manage to regionalise England, um, it wouldn't actually provide the rebalancing the constitution that unionists in Scotland and Wales hope it might. Very briefly, just to conclude, where are we now in terms of moving forward? Well, in terms of the two uh, parties that matter on the British level, Labour seem to have can handed the keys um, to Gordon Brown, who's apparently devising a plan for the future of the UK which involves um, you know, things that Willie was talking about now, such as reforming the House of Lords, but also some plan for regionalising England. It's very hard to imagine whatever initiative emerges from the Brown camp as not involving some plan to regionalise England, which is a huge electoral risk to Labour. I mean, can I be really blunt? This is an unpopular Scot suggesting radical changes to England that most people in England don't support. I mean, it's such an easy win. Uh, it's such an open goal for the Conservatives. It's very easy to foresee a rerun, however cynical it might be, uh, a rerun of the 2015 experience. The Conservatives then, by contrast, hardly mention England these days, but their agenda for Britain including unwinding devolution to Scotland and Wales, resonates with the majority of those who feel English, whilst further alienating those in England who don't feel particularly English, and crucially, those in Scotland and Wales who feel Scottish, which I suspect at the end of the day only kind of increases the tensions uh, at the heart of the union, uh, and it's very difficult to see any long term stability emerging from this kind of combination of structures and public attitudes that we've tried to portray. And I think I'll stop there.
Great. Uh, thanks, you both. Uh, really fascinating stuff. Um, and I must say, I, I must be part of that um, growing number of people that identify as English because my whole team didn't realise that was half English till a few weeks ago when I told them. So, uh, yeah, um, one thing that kind of strike, struck me from, from, from your work is that Englishness appears to be born out of sense, this type of Englishness anyway, seems to be born out of a type of, a, 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 a sense of grievance. Uh, if you're sitting in Scotland or, or Wales for that matter, you might think that, well, Englishness, is, English have always had, you know, the bigger share of the power and the bigger sense of, uh, you know, bigger part of, uh, of government. So wh where do you think, where does that sense of not being heard and not being represented come from? Shall I, I start and then? Um, well, I would say two things to that. First of all, it, it, you know, if you look at English attitudes to whether each part of the UK gets their own fair share, you know, we asked this in, in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And having been looking at English attitudes since 2011, we were looking at the figures we were getting back and thinking, gosh, levels of grievance are high in England. But once you because they, they're convinced they don't get their fair share of resources and that Scotland gets more than its fair share of resources. But the thing is, if you look at the data from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, they're equally convinced that the system is not fair, right? So the, direct, the sense of grievance in England is interesting and new to us, in part just because we haven't been looking for it before. It was always there. Um, and it was it's 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 there to the same extent in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland and to a certain extent actually is higher. The sense of grievance in Scotland is higher with the distribution of of resources than than it is in, in England. So that that's one thing I would say. And I and to me, the answer is partly that England England lacks what those other three parts have, which is a legislature that provides an opportunity for the political community, the national community, to express itself as a political community. So England doesn't have that same opportunity. And however much they, they are um, dominant within Westminster because of the demographic weight of England, it still doesn't transform Westminster into an English parliament. So there is not a legislature that allows the English political community to express itself as a political community. And so I think a lot of the frustration with the status quo and the sense of grievance about how it runs, how resources are distributed, and also the, the distribution of influence within the union boils down to the fact that that legislature is missing for England. I'm just going to say that if anybody's got questions from the audience, if you can just post them in the chat and then I'll, I'll, I'll be able to get them and, and, and put them in the next part of the session. Just on what Ilsa said there, Richard, uh, uh, it seems that there's like a lot of pressures on the British state from 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 the nations, but also from inside England that people are have these sense of grievances. What what do you what do you think the chances of the British state being able to reform itself and 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 why you know what makes that possible and what makes it not possible? Okay, um, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I, I, can I can I start with with I mean absolutely agree with with everything Elsa has said. I, I'd approach uh, another and uh, maybe another angle in terms of understanding what's going on here is, uh, and also maybe it might be helpful to to people who are watching and listening to get a sense of how we understand what's going on. A, a, a lot of people have understood. Um, Especially people on the centre left, and I would count myself on the centre left. Okay, so I, uh, but you know, the the, the tendency is to under to try to view things in socio-economic terms, and therefore, if there's a socio-economic um, problem, so it's the left behinds, right? So Brexit is about the left behinds. It's the rage of people left behind by globalisation or whatever. So you know what to do about it. You establish a, a task force, and you you know pump some money into. You, you, you even level up, my God. Um, um, our lens for understanding what's going on is a different one. Uh, it, it's, it's nationalism. Uh, and uh, lots of things one can say about nationalism, but what all nationalism seem to have in common 
uh, or at least most nationalisms, is, is a kind of a story about the past, the present and the future. And what you have, you, you, you talk about a sense of grievance. It, it is a sense of grievance, but it's also a sense of loss. And what, what if you like, English nationalists think, uh, they, they view Britain as having this great past, this glorious past, and then they view the present as much reduced. And, you know, we were subservient, we lost our freedom to Europe is the way that it's phrased, okay? And then what nationalists propose is, is a, a better future, which involves invoking the, better, the, the glorious past, taking things from that past uh, into the future. Now, all nationalisms have a, have a different version of that, more or less pathological, but that is, you know, I'm sure everybody listening, watching, will be able to think of, well, that's how the Brexit argument works. You know, that is very much the argument, the, the kind of rhetorical structure of what we've seen over the last decade. Uh, and it's won. The, these people have won. So in terms of can this stuff, so your question then, Willie, is can the state hope to um, assuage, you know, those views, the people who are currently running the state, as well as other people who are, you know, a very large minority in England, a majority in Scotland, uh, a large minority in Wales, a majority in Northern Ireland. In my view, not. You know, I think, I think because, you know, the, oh, I think we're already seeing that, that the kind of fantasy of the glorious past somehow being reborn in, in global Britain is, is, is a tough one. Meanwhile, it's alienating everybody else. But um, but you know the the reason I kind of went off on that digression is that is actually to to agree with where you started the conversation, Willie, which is to say understanding the nature of where we are is so vital, and I think what we're trying to to do is is present a, a different um, view or a different diagnosis of where how we've arrived at this point than is usually the case because people tend to ignore. Englishness and think that nationalism happens, you know, people like me with my accent and, you know, obviously speaking English as a second language who are the nationalists, not people at the core of the state. And what we're saying is that this is at the core of the state and reshaping the state in ways that, you know, people at the periphery just haven't managed yet, at least. Great. Uh, that's that's brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, just before I go on to questions from, from the audience, um, as the Electoral Reform Society, we, we, we kind of think that part of the problem is the inability of the representative system to represent the groups of voters. Um, and I think we saw in Scotland when there was a, the big switch to the SNP that some of these seats like um, Airdrie and Shorts that had like, you know, over 20,000 majority, Labour majorities for, for decades, um, suddenly these people felt that they weren't getting represented. And you can understand why, because if you looked at the policy programmes, they were aimed at swing voters in Edinburgh South or Dumbert, Barton West, where, 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 there was a, where there was a submarine base. Um, and these are still seats that Labour, Labour tends to hold. So um, it seems that the same thing happened in, in England just a lot later on because it's a bigger jump to go from 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 Labour to Tory. But it seems that these a lot of these voters just felt like they there was no policy prog programs aimed at them, um, and we would say that is a big function of the electoral system. So I don't know if you've got any any comments on that. I'm I'm not I I. I... You know, obviously, I mean, you know better than I do how we have um, uh, multiple electoral systems in operation in Scotland, and and I don't know if there's actually been any research that looks at whether we see a different kind of targeting in party manifestos across local, devolved, and Westminster elections that can then that can be attributed to the electoral system rather than the territorial scale at which those at which different policy decisions are made so i i think i think 
I think the hunch is probably not wrong, but I think proving it would be a heck of a task um, because you'd have to disentangle uh, a bunch of things. I think f for me, one of the things that's quite difficult is that the UK government, you know, earlier I was saying there is not an institution that allows the English political community to express itself. Um, and however dominant England is within Westminster, it doesn't make Westminster an English legislature. And yet we also know that the UK government acts for the whole of the UK in some instances and for England alone in others. And I think one thing that would be tremendously helpful is if the UK government was clear about when it was acting for England and when it was acting for the whole of the UK and stopped using the, the that awful dodge, this country, which fails to kind of clarify what the territorial reach of different policies are. And I, I think that would serve two purposes. I, th I think that would help both a, a Scottish audience, which, um, which tends to overestimate we a Westminster influence, but it would also help an English audience understand that there are instances in which the UK government is providing that space um, for English policy. And I, I think the, the, the comms from different uh, civil service departments, as well as um, from government ministers, is shockingly lacking in precision about the territorial reach of policies. And I think that would actually make a, a positive difference. We know that levels of, of knowledge about devolution are patchy across the UK. And part of that is because the communication about that is so poor. Richard? Yeah, um, I mean, we have... I've lit, I've recently been hearing people in in the Labour Party in in Wales arguing for electoral reform on the basis that it would help bind the union together. Um, um, I, I'm I'm very sympathetic to electoral reform reform personally. I'm not entirely convinced of that 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 is a particularly um, powerful argument in its favour, you know, for, for several reasons. One of which is that, um, I mean, England is so big compared to the rest of the of the UK. England is 85%, Scotland is 7 Wales is 5 You know, England is overwhelmingly dominant within the state. And, you know, you can't electoral ref electorally reform your way out of that. It would make it, you know, you can make a difference at the margin uh, um, in actually representing the variation of views within these territories um but you know i think i think one needs to be realistic about just the geopolitics of, of the state i mean one of the things which which really uh strikes me um about the uk and this is i guess a particularly welsh thing to say because next year in almost exactly sorry uh, in exactly a year and a couple of weeks' time, uh, Wales will be marking the 100th anniversary of Labour winning every election in Wales. So we've got a, a century of one-party dominance coming up. And what's interesting uh, is that Scotland and England look very much like Wales. You've got a dominant party in Scotland, uh, a dominant party in England, a dominant party in Wales. And it seems to me that that fundamental reality is so often ignored in debates about British politics and what it means in terms of the organisation of the state. Um, I, you know, I'm very much in favour of electoral reform in the sense that it will, it's a, you know, if we, um, in, in Westminster terms, Labour dominates absolutely in Wales on, and it doesn't often get over half the votes. And there's a real issue with the way, and, you know, we see that in, uh, UK general election in Scotland now, where you know the SNP wins overwhelmingly um, on on an admittedly large proportion of vote, but still, so there is something to be said for electoral reform in terms of showing that these three territories aren't um, uh, monochrome, if you like, but but England is still absolutely dominant within the state as a whole, and we need to get our heads around that and work out what that means for the management of the state. Um, yeah, just going to throw in some questions from the audience now. Just to get a few in, I'm, I'm going to offer three at a time. So you, you just decide which which bits of which ones you want to respond to. But there's, there's one specifically for Ailsa from Anna. 
Um, do you think there is an attitude for another level of government that would include an English parliament? And then there's one from Ken that says, uh, you talk about an English attitude. Is there a perceived north-south uh, divide in that? Um, and there's a lot of questions on regionalism and metal, met, metro mayors. Um, uh, is there anywhere that regionalism might work in England, do you know of? Yeah, so the regionalism question is a fascinating one because we keep checking, rechecking the data because every single time we talk about Englishness, someone rightly calls us on the fact that we haven't preempted this by saying whether it varies across regions in England. And in the 10 years that we've been looking at it, we have never managed to find evidence of significant regional variation in patterns of English national identity, but also the relationship between English national identity and Euroscepticism and the relationship between English national identity and Devo anxiety. So the two unions argument holds across England. The exception to that is London, and on some measures to a slightly weaker degree, the Southeast. But there the argument is that it's more compositional effect than contextual effect. In other words, it's it's to do with the composition of London. It's it's to do with the, the migration of individuals to, to London, the fact that the individuals who choose to live in London are demographically and socioeconomically unlike or less like the rest, um, the rest of England. And so that's why we see a slightly different pattern in relationships and a slightly weaker sense of English national identity in London than we do in the rest of England. But to, to for the rest of England, we don't see regional variation in the relationship between English national identity and the other the other constellations of political attitudes. Now that's that relates to the question about whether there's an appetite for for another layer of government and opposition to the carving up of England, because you can see what you can see what people have done. The, 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 the data make clear that people have a strong sense of English national identity. The data also make clear that people do have a strong sense of regional identity. So we don't see regional patterns in terms of how national identity relates to, to political attitudes in England, but we do see a strong sense of regional identity. And so you can kind of put those two things together with the fact that England is so demographically larger than the, than it, it, it occupies such a demographic weight in terms of the UK, you can understand what people are thinking. Hang on a minute, strong regional identity. England is huge compared to everyone else. Uh, why not carve it up into Scotland-sized chunks or Wales-sized chunks? It's less destabilizing in terms of the state because the parts are all more equal to each other. It also satisfies this sense of regional identity and it satisfies an appetite for subsidiarity. And all of those things are true, except for the fact that it doesn't express the the uh, it doesn't address the appetite for some sort of institutional layer that allows England to express itself as a political community. And it also would be a foolproof plan were it not for the fact that the only thing that pulls worse than the status quo in England is carving England up into Scotland sized chunks. So in terms of an, ad, uh, an appetite for change, yes. If, if, we, if we give people a long list and ask them to pick which one they like best, but also if we ask people to evaluate how much they like different options when, a, when we put them to them, and if we make them choose, what do you want? Treat England as England or carve it up into different uh, regions. Carving it up n never, ever pulls well. And it has never pulled well in the 10 years that we've been doing it. So there's a disconnect there between what, what works institutionally and structurally for the state and what the electorate actually wants. Just and just just to um one just point to amplify there, because I think it's worth um uh, it's worth saying this. We we've we've spent a long time looking for 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 this because we are we're often told quite forcefully that we've got this wrong. And there's an appetite for some kind of regional governments in England, and um, and so you know people then we say well we can't find it, and they said but you're using the wrong territorial boundaries. If you were using you know nobody nobody cares about the the government's official statistical regions, right? 
So it's about the North or the Midlands or use something else. So we've tried that. Uh, we've tried city regions. We, we, we <laughs> bring us a unit and we'll try it, okay? And we just can't, we just can't um, find it. The other thing about public attitudes, um, um, which, is, which is kind of difficult in terms of working our way through this conundrum, is that um, there's actually quite a lot of support for the idea of local government. Um, but, um, and so, you know, if I, if, if I, if I was given any power over this, I would, you know, I would think, well, actually let's think about what we can do around local government. But the problem there is that, uh, there's actually very little support for policy variation. Okay. And, um, and that's, that's, that's really, an that's really an, uh, an unhelpful, uh, dimension of the, um, of public attitudes, because if you if you believe that that England is overly centralised and it will be helpful in all kinds of ways to loosen the grip of the centre, then you know policy variation, uh, 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 variation in outcomes is the inevitable cor corollary of that. But you know you, that tabloid stuff about the postcode lottery and how you know that is really very very deeply felt. Um, we we tried at various points to. To, to test what people are willing to see vary. And it doesn't go much beyond the days that your bins are collected. I mean, it really is very, very limited indeed. Uh, thanks both for that. Um, questions from William and Steve asking about Metro Mayors uh, and Steve saying that English identity seems to revolve around people football but he doesn't know many people who identify regionally um is it what 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 do you think the the effect of metro mayors and 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 what 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 might they tell us about english governance there's um also about the shifts in english british identity um has there been changes in the attitudes of people in england towards the union and that, what is there any is there is there a cohort of people in, in, in England who identify as European and do, do we know much about them? I think one of the, and I think this may be Elsa's trademarked phrase, so um, I she really should have spoken first and said this first. We've been using a phrase, uh, ambivalent unionism, um, uh, a lot. And like I say, I think it's trademark uh, Elsa Henderson. Um, uh, and one of the ways where we've actually surfaced this and it, it's, it's become uh, on occasion very controversial is following the Brexit uh, results, we tried to probe um, people's, what, what trade-offs people were willing to make on both sides of the Brexit argument. And so um, on, the, um, on the lever side, um, was it worth uh, a border poll in Northern Ireland uh, or even uh, the reemergence of the, the end of the peace process in Northern Ireland? Was that a price worth paying for getting Brexit done? Was a second independence referendum in Scotland and actually a yes vote, was that a price worth paying to get Brexit done? And what was remarkable and shocking to many, but it was then repeated, by other people using different, um, you know, slightly different questions, et cetera. So it was confirmed is that around 80, over 80% 80 of conservative leavers in both England and Scotland said, yes, in both cases, that was a price worth paying for Brexit. Now, um, lest some of you get all snotty about the leavers, this, that basically there was a similar, not quite such high percentages, but on the Remain side, you know, it, could you somehow conceive of remaining in Europe? And obviously it was a slightly more um, speculative uh, proposition on, on the Remain side, but, you know, would you, would you be willing to see Scotland becoming in, independent if you could? Would you trade the union of the UK for the European Union? Yes. So actually... What was really striking is that you know conservatives, the Conservative and Unionist Party, were willing to trade the UK to get out of the European Union. And actually, when you dig deeper, 
it's really remarkable how few friends the union have has in a, in a kind of completely unambiguous way. And if you compare that to Canada or, or Spain, the, the, the kind of ambivalence, the willingness to conceive of letting the union go is really quite remarkable. Ilsa, I've stolen your pitch, so maybe you, I should let you in here and let you say something. Uh, you can use one of my lines. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, just one other question that we have in there is um, it, it asks, forces people to say, right, what, what do you want? Because, you know, when you when you measure support for independence for your part of the UK, then it kind of does take the most radical option available. So we were trying to tease out what 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 were the contours of support for the union as it stands. And we have a question in there that is basically saying, I want independence for my part. Uh, or the union as it is right now is a priority for me. I want it to stay as it is. And then what we're calling this kind of ambivalent unionist option. Uh, I don't want independence for my part, but if one or more other parts of the UK go their own way, then so be it. Right. And if you add together the proportion that want independence and the proportion who select this ambivalent unionist option, then you're at over half of the electorate that holds a view in every single part of the UK. Now, the balance is different in different parts, right? You've got much more supporters of independence in Scotland and you have relatively few ambivalent unionists. In England, you've got 10% wanting independence and about 40% who would describe themselves as ambivalent unionists. But everywhere in the union you have, if you add together those who want radical change and those who are quite happy for the union for the union to change radically, but for, for others to do the changing, um, then you're at over half. And, and I think that's a that puts the union in a very difficult position, right? There's there's a number of constraints here that make solving the English problem or addressing the English question really, really difficult. That demographic weight issue, it's hard to figure out what the solution is, particularly if you then square that with a lack of support for carving it up. That, that devolution paradox, the fact that people want regions to have more say, but they also want uniform policy across the state. That's, that's a hard thing to, to grapple with. And then you've also got this notion of uh, of, of ambivalent unionism. And you might think that the ambivalent unionists and those who want independence are only those who are prioritizing their Scottish identity, their Welsh identity, their English identity, but even among British identifiers in England. So those who would be most committed to the union, you've got between a quarter and a third who would describe themselves as ambivalent unionists. So even in that one group where you would you would think that that is the last refuge of unionist support, we can see the cracks there in terms of what people are willing to put up with in the union. And I think in, in the English sense, you know, I, I keep saying we need a, you know, we keep doing serial ad hocery and we're getting ourselves into all kinds of mess. We need a first principles discussion about what the union is for. And people rightly keep pointing out to me, but that's not very English, is it? I mean, that's that sounds like a fundamentally radical uh, conversation to have. That doesn't sit well with a small C conservative English English political culture that does that does tend to, to tinkering as as a, as an option. And I think that ambivalent unionism helps us to understand precisely that in England, because the English don't want radical change. They don't want independence for their own part, but they do seem to be perfectly happy to be left the state on their own if other parts just decide to go their own way. So you, you arrive at the same end point, England on its own, but it's not because you've done anything radical. It's because you've just seen the other parts sort of drift away. We've got five minutes, so I'm going to I'm going to pose three questions, um, and hopefully we can we can just get through them quite quickly. Some of them are probably just amplifications of, of things that you've you've said before. Um, so England is the only nation stuck with first past the post at a local level, and we've now seen the government trying to change the way we elect mayors and police and crime commissioners. Do you think that uh, this is why current demand for PR are so strong? If they are, uh, what could we learn from generally, not just electro Germany, not just electro system, but decentralisation? The fact you don't just have Berlin, but Bonn, Frankfurt, Frankfurt, etc. Maybe could identify cultural and social identity. And then there's one about 
the domination of it by public school mindset and government causing many of these problems that there seems to be a, a culture that they're still fighting WW2 and running an empire. I mean, on the electoral on the electoral reform point, I think that's a I think that's a really important point. And for me, the exciting thing to watch is is what's going on in Wales at the local level, because now obviously the the default is first past the post. But we now have legislation that allows local authorities, if they go through certain processes, to select a different electoral system to move to STV if they wish to. And I think that's that's a really important one. Because we've we've not yet had in Scotland an, a, a debate about how STV changes the way that individuals interact with their representatives, how representatives interact with one another when you have large multi-member wards. So the fact that you can have that naturally occurring experiment with different electoral systems in Wales, I think, is one of the real exciting elements of of what's going on um, uh, in, what's going on politically. So on, on the first past the post side, I, I would say, yes, worth exploring. And the data that are likely to be most helpful to us are likely to come from Wales. I'm not going to comment on the, the public school and uh, the public school culture, although it is worth, it's certainly worth exploring. Well, I, well, I am, I'm going to okay. comment. I'm going to comment on that because, um, you know, the, the point, uh, the point was made about, um, Empire nostalgia, and and I mean I I think I I tried to say that absolutely a particular sense of Britain's past is centrally important in terms of understanding um, the impact of English nationalism uh, in transforming uh, Britain, uh, and so absolutely that is part of it. And the Second World War clearly, and, and a particular understanding of the Second World War clearly plays a large part uh, in, in that. But um, I'm also fascinated by the, the public school um, point. I mean, one of the things which we explore in, in, in the book, and I'm going to wave a copy at you, is, um, is that um, we, we look at the attitudes which associate with, with Englishness. And one of the things which isn't a huge uh, which doesn't associate with Englishness. Something George Orwell spoke about this back in the 40s, that you know, the English are not particularly bothered with equality. Yeah, freedom is a more important value than equality. And that, you know, that gives people with my political views the vapors, basically. But you know, th there's some really striking evidence which I would urge you to look at in the book about what what values coalesce with Englishness and which don't. And if you, and again, to go back, Willie, to your starting point about understanding how we got to where we've got to, I mean, I, I mean, Wales has got almost no um, private education, right? So, I mean, none of this makes any sense to me. But, uh, and, and I find it deeply, uh, you know, deeply weird. But, you know, one cannot assume that even people with a very different educational background or income background share that view uh, if you've got a different sense of your country's history present and potential future fantastic Thank, thanks um to both of you for a really interesting contribution and lots to think about and i think lots for um us to take on board when we're, we're, we're thinking about how we plot our course um and thanks to the audience for um uh, uh participating and, and all these great questions so um, look out for our next ERS seminar um, we'll, we'll email, email people about that so thanks again everyone and have a good evening